Chapter Seven of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From a distance, the Euphrosyne looked very small. Glasses were turned upon her from the decks of great liners, and she was pronounced a tramp, a cargo boat, or one of those wretched little passenger steamers where people rolled about among the cattle on deck. The insect-like figures of Dalloways, Ambroses, and Vinraces were also derided, both from the extreme smallness of their persons, and the doubt which only strong glasses could dispel as to whether they were really live creatures or only lumps on the rigging. Mr. Pepper, with all his learning, had been mistaken for a cormorant, and then as unjustly transformed into a cow. At night, indeed, when the waltzes were swinging in the saloon and gifted passengers reciting the little ship shrunk to a few beads of light out among the dark waves and one high in air upon the masthead seemed something mysterious and impressive to heated partners resting from the dance she became a ship passing in the night an emblem of the loneliness of human life an occasion for queer confidences and sudden appeals for sympathy. On and on she went, by day and by night, following her path, until one morning broke and showed the land. Losing its shadow-like appearance, it became first cleft and mountainous, next coloured grey and purple, next scattered with white blocks which gradually separated themselves and then as the progress of the ship acted upon the view like a field-glass of increasing power became streets of houses by nine o'clock the euphrosyne had taken up her position in the middle of a great bay she dropped her anchor immediately as if she were a recumbent giant requiring examination small boats came swarming about her she rang with cries Men jumped on to her, her deck was thumped by feet. The lonely little island was invaded from all quarters at once, and after four weeks of silence it was bewildering to hear human speech. Mrs. Ambrose alone heeded none of this stir. She was pale with suspense while the boat with mail-bags was making towards them. Absorbed in her letters, she did not notice that she had left the Euphrosyne and felt no sadness when the ship lifted up her voice and bellowed thrice like a cow separated from its calf. "'The children are well,' she exclaimed. Mr. Pepper, who sat opposite with a great mound of bag and rug upon his knees, said, gratifying. Rachel, to whom the end of the voyage meant a complete change of perspective, was too much bewildered by the approach of the shore to realize what children were well or why it was gratifying. Helen went on reading. Moving very slowly and rearing absurdly high over each wave, the little boat was now approaching a white crescent of sand. Behind this was a deep green valley with distinct hills on either side. On the slope of the right-hand hill, white houses with brown roofs were settled like nesting sea-birds and at intervals cypresses striped the hill with black bars mountains whose sides were flushed with red but whose crowns were bald rose as a pinnacle half concealing another pinnacle behind it the hour being still early the whole view was exquisitely light and airy the blues and greens of sky and tree were intense but not sultry. As they drew nearer and could distinguish details, the effect of the earth with its minute objects and colours and different forms of life was overwhelming after four weeks of the sea, and kept them silent. Three hundred years odd, said Mr. Pepper, meditatively at length. As nobody said, what? He merely extracted a bottle and swallowed a pill. The piece of information that died within him was to the effect that three hundred years ago five Elizabethan barks had anchored where the Euphrosyne now floated. Half drawn up upon the beach lay an equal number of Spanish galleons, unmanned, 
for the country was still a virgin land behind a veil. Slipping across the water, the English sailors bore away bars of silver, bales of linen, timbers of cedar wood, golden crucifixes knobbed with emeralds. When the Spaniards came down from their drinking, a fight ensued, the two parties churning up the sand and driving each other into the surf. The Spaniards, bloated with fine living upon the fruits of the miraculous land, fell in heaps. But the hardy Englishmen, tawny with sea voyaging, hairy for lack of razors, with muscles like wire, fangs greedy for flesh, and fingers itching for gold, dispatched the wounded, drove the dying into the sea, and soon reduced the natives to a state of superstitious wonderment. Here a settlement was made, women were imported, children grew. All seemed to favour the expansion of the British Empire, and had there been men like Richard Dalloway in the time of Charles I, the map would undoubtedly be red where it is now an odious green. But it must be supposed that the political mind of that age lacked imagination, and merely for want of a few thousand pounds and a few thousand men, the spark died that should have been a conflagration. From the interior came Indians with subtle poisons, naked bodies, and painted idols. From the sea came vengeful Spaniards and rapacious Portuguese, exposed to all these enemies, though the climate proved wonderfully kind and the earth abundant. The English dwindled away and all but disappeared. Somewhere about the middle of the seventeenth century, a single sloop watched its season and slipped out by night, bearing within it all that was left of the great British colony. A few men, a few women, and perhaps a dozen dusky children. English history then denies all knowledge of the place. Owing to one cause and another, civilization shifted its centre to a spot some four or five hundred miles to the south and to-day santa marina is not much larger than it was three hundred years ago in population it is a happy compromise for portuguese fathers wed indian mothers and their children intermarry with the spanish although they get their ploughs from manchester they make their coats from their own sheep their silk from their own worms and their furniture from their own cedar trees so that in arts and industries the place is still much where it was in elizabethan days the reasons which had drawn the english across the sea to found a small colony within the last ten years are not so easily described and will never perhaps be recorded in history books granted facility of travel peace good trade and so on there was besides a kind of dissatisfaction among the English with the older countries, and the enormous accumulations of carved stone, stained glass, and rich brown painting which they offered to the tourist. The movement in search of something new was of course infinitely small, affecting only a handful of well-to-do people. It began by a few schoolmasters serving their passage out to South America as the pursers of tramp steamers. They returned in time for the summer term, when their stories of the splendours and hardships of life at sea, the humours of sea captains, the wonders of night and dawn, and the marvels of the place delighted outsiders and sometimes found their way into print. The country itself taxed all the powers of description, for they said it was much bigger than Italy and really nobler than Greece. Again they declared that the natives were strangely beautiful, very big in stature, dark, passionate, and quick to seize the knife. The place seemed new, and full of new forms of beauty, in proof of which they showed handkerchiefs which the women had worn round their heads, and primitive carvings coloured bright greens and blues. Somehow or other, as fashions do, the fashion spread. An old monastery was quickly turned into a hotel, while a famous line of steamships altered its route for the convenience of passengers. 
Oddly enough it happened that the least satisfactory of Helen Ambrose's brothers had been sent out years before to make his fortune, at any rate to keep clear of racehorses, in the very spot which had now become so popular. Often, leaning upon the column in the veranda, he had watched the English ships with English schoolmasters for pursers steaming into the bay. Having at length earned enough to take a holiday, and being sick of the place, he proposed to put his villa on the slope of the mountain at his sister's disposal. She too had been a little stirred by the talk of a new world, where there was always sun and never a fog, which went on around her, and the chance, when they were planning where to spend the winter out of England, seemed too good to be missed. For these reasons she determined to accept Willoughby's offer of free passages on his ship, to place the children with their grandparents, and to do the thing thoroughly while she was about it. Taking seats in a carriage drawn by long-tailed horses with pheasants' feathers erect between their ears, the Ambroses, Mr. Pepper, and Rachel rattled out of the harbour. The day increased in heat as they drove up the hill. The road passed through the town, where men seemed to be beating brass and crying water, where the passage was blocked by mules and cleared by whips and curses, where the women walked barefoot, their heads balancing baskets, and cripples hastily displayed mutilated members. It issued among steep green fields, not so green but that the earth showed through great trees now shaded all but the centre of the road, and a mountain stream so shallow and so swift that it plaited itself into strands as it ran, raced along the edge. Higher they went, until Ridley and Rachel walked behind. Next they turned along a lane, scattered with stones, where Mr. Pepper raised his stick and silently indicated a shrub bearing among sparse leaves a voluminous purple blossom, and at a rickety canter the last stage of the way was accomplished. The villa was a roomy white house which, as is the case with most continental houses, looked to an English eye frail, ramshackle, and absurdly frivolous, more like a pagoda in a tea-garden than a place where one slept. The garden urgently called for the services of gardener, bushes waved their branches across the paths, and the blades of grass with spaces of earth between them could be counted. In the circular piece of ground in front of the veranda were two cracked vases, from which red flowers drooped, with a stone fountain between them, now parched in the sun. The circular garden led to a long garden, where the gardener's shears had scarcely been unless now and then when he cut a bough of blossom for his beloved. A few tall trees shaded it, and round bushes with wax-like flowers mobbed their heads together in a row. A garden smoothly laid with turf, divided by thick hedges, with raised beds of bright flowers such as we keep within walls in England, would have been out of place upon the side of this bare hill. There was no ugliness to shut out, and the villa looked straight across the shoulder of a slope, ribbed with olive trees, to the sea. The indecency of the whole place struck Mrs. Chailey forcibly. There were no blinds to shut out the sun, nor was there any furniture to speak of for the sun to spoil. Standing in the bare stone hall, and surveying a staircase of superb breadth, but cracked and carpetless, she further ventured the opinion that there were rats as large as terriers at home, and that if one put one's foot down with any force, one would come through the floor. As for hot water, at this point her investigations left her speechless. Poor creature, she murmured to the sallow Spanish servant girl, who came out with the pigs and hens to receive them. No wonder you hardly look like a human being. Maria accepted the compliment with an exquisite Spanish grace. In Chailey's opinion, they would have done better to stay on board an English ship, but none knew better than she that her duty commanded her to stay. 
when they were settled in and in train to find daily occupation there was some speculation as to the reasons which induced mr pepper to stay taking up his lodging in the ambrose's house efforts had been made for some days before landing to impress upon him the advantages of the amazons that great stream helen would begin gazing as if she saw a visionary cascade i've a good mind to go with you myself willoughby only i can't think of the sunsets and the moonrises i believe the colours are unimaginable there are wild peacocks rachel hazarded and marvellous creatures in the water helen asserted one might discover a new reptile rachel continued there's certain to be a revolution i'm told helen urged the effect of these subterfuges was a little dashed by ridley who after regarding pepper for some moments sighed aloud poor fellow and inwardly speculated upon the unkindness of women he stayed however in apparent contentment for six days playing with a microscope and a notebook in one of the many sparsely furnished sitting-rooms but on the evening of the seventh day as they sat at dinner he appeared more restless than usual the dinner-table was set between two long windows which were left uncurtained by helen's orders darkness fell as sharply as a knife in this climate and the town then sprang out in circles and lines of bright dots beneath them buildings which never showed by day showed by night and the sea flowed right over the land judging by the moving lights of the steamers the sight fulfilled the same purpose as an orchestra in a london restaurant and silence had its setting william pepper observed it for some time he put on his spectacles to contemplate the scene i've identified the big block to the left he observed and pointed with his fork at a square formed by several rows of lights one should infer that they can cook vegetables he added an hotel said helen wants a monastery said mr pepper nothing more was said then but the day after mr pepper returned from a midday walk and stood silently before helen who was reading in the veranda i've taken a room over there he said you're not going she exclaimed on the whole yes he remarked no private cook can cook vegetables knowing his dislike of questions which she to some extent shared helen asked no more still an uneasy suspicion lurked in her mind that william was hiding a wound she flushed to think that her words or her husband's or rachel's had penetrated and stung she was half moved to cry stop william explain and would have returned to the subject at luncheon if william had not shown himself inscrutable and chill lifting fragments of salad on the point of his fork with the gesture of a man pronging seaweed detecting gravel suspecting germs if you all die of typhoid i won't be responsible he snapped if you die of dullness neither will i helen echoed in her heart she reflected that she had never yet asked him whether he had been in love they had got further and further from that subject instead of drawing nearer to it and she could not help feeling it a relief when william pepper with all his knowledge his microscope his notebooks his genuine kindliness and good sense but a certain dryness of soul took his departure also she could not help feeling it sad that friendships should end thus although in this case to have the room empty was something of a comfort and she tried to console herself with the reflection that one never knows how far other people feel the things they might be supposed to feel End of chapter 7